Thank you very much. We cannot talk about Marcus Garvey without talking about the whole of the African world and how the African world relates to the rest of the world. One of the things we have lost most dear to us that has done the greatest damage to us, we have lost the feeling of ourselves as being a people so important. We stand at the center of the world and all the world revolves around us. It is hard for us to think of ourselves in that way, but that's the way it is. That silly wall in Western Asia, mistakenly called the Middle East, is indirectly about us, because if it wasn't for certain things that had happened to us, the condition of those nations would be different. They rose up first. They got their first nationhood, their first shaping in world history through the slave trade that rose after the rise of Islam. And they used Islam as the handmaiden for the trade as the European used Christianity as the handmaiden for their slave trade that lasted 500 years and that's not over to this day. You have failed to make a connection between yourself and everything that's happening in the world. We have some misconceptions about Marcus Garvey. We have some misconceptions brought into being because certain people want to wash their ego. There are people who said that Marcus Garvey came to America and found black America with a wishbone and gave him a backbone, which is a lie. What you have to do in order to understand Marcus Garvey and his significance is to look at the Caribbean islands 100 years before he was born and look at black America 100 years before he was born. I will begin by discussing the antecedents of Marcus Garvey. Let's look at the antecedents of Marcus Garvey in the Caribbean islands with major emphasis on Jamaica. Then you can see how it was logical for a Marcus Garvey to emerge. In an island where color consciousness was a prevailing thing, how did this jet black man emerge with no color consciousness toward himself and with no apology for his being? Because he looked back at the revolutionary heritage of the island that gave him birth and the revolutionary heritage of the Caribbean islands itself that had the most successful slave revolts of any African people outside of Africa. Successful because they maintained an African culture continuity until they suddenly decided in the middle of the 19th century that they would become black English and black Dutch and black French and black every damn thing except Africa. <laughs> but until that point, there were people using their African culture continuity in revolt and holding themselves together based on this culture continuity. Now, Let's look at the roots of this culture continuity and the roots of the emergence of a Marcus Garvey and why his emergence in the Caribbean islands is absolutely logical. 
then we have to think at the end of it. Because if Marcus Garvey was walking down the streets of Jamaica right now with the same idea, with the same program, some disarranged Jamaican would stone him to death. It is so ungodly at this point. It is so far from Garvey. Now, they kill him because they have bargained their African culture continuity and their African self to be those things most unlike themselves. Now, Marcus Garvey, born 1887. Now let's look at what was happening 1787 in those islands. The Maroon revolts were already in motion and had not only flourished in Jamaica, it had flourished throughout the Caribbean islands. The so-called Bush Negro revolts had already occurred in Serena. The Bad Beast revolt in Guyana had already occurred. The Haitian Maroons were already on the march, and the Haitian Maroons were on the march the same time as the Jamaican Maroons, although the Jamaican Maroons are the best known. There were Maroons throughout the hemisphere, including the United States. Now, in this period of resistance to slavery, something was happening on this island. 1830 and thereabouts, the British went through the motion of emancipating their slaves. It was a motion only. Now, while the slave was emancipated, he had to go back and work on the same plantation where he had been a slave because no other employment was open to him. Now he must take care of his wife, his children, his housing, his clothing for a pittance. So the new freedom was less secure than the old slavery. By 1865, the Jamaicans began to discover that the slave, that the emancipation was a fake. This is why it is nonsense when a Caribbean person said, our freedom came 30 years before your emancipation. All you're saying is that your fakery came 30 years before our fakery <laughs> in as much as. <laughs> in as much as neither one of us are emancipated to this day because emancipation is nothing that someone can do for you it is something either you do for yourself or it is not real. <laughs> Freedom is something you take with your own hands. You secure it with your own hands. No generation leaves it for another generation. Each generation in its own way even if it inherits freedom, must secure that freedom all over again with its own strength, its own will, its own hands. And when you forget that and become lax, you have freedom no more. All right, 1850 in the Caribbean islands, the British, the, the the Jamaican colors approached the British. They wanted special privileges. And they were telling the British, if you give us the special privileges, we will protect you from the blacks. And when the British were reluctant to give them special privileges, 
by 1865, they said, give us these privileges or we're going to join the blacks. Now, this accounts for the large number of mulattoes involved in the Moret, Moret Bay uprising 1865, and Gordon and other mulattoes who committed themselves to that revolution. Once the British understood this, they gradually began to give these privileges. They began to create a multi-ethnic society based on color to the point where Jamaica became the most stratified society along color, caste, and economic lines in all the world almost as stratified as India with its multiplicity of caste. Seventy different definitions of color and caste in Jamaica alone. Special jobs for different people of special gradation of color and hair texture. And this would destabilize the country to the point where the British had an internal army protecting them. And this robbed Jamaica of the privilege that went to Haiti. The Haitian revolts were set in motion by Jamaicans. Jamaicans, troublemakers, that they wanted to get rid of, so they sold them to plantations in Haiti. The Jamaican farmers sold them to plantations in, in Haiti, and the most noted being Bokeman, who decided he's going to be a priest. That he's a priest, and he wasn't going to work on the farm. So as a priest, he began to organize the Yoruba slaves and the solidification of the Haitian Revolution to the point, and he moved it so fast Tucson and Lovature had to run to catch up with the revolution in order to lead it. <laughs> and yet, these there are two Jamaicans left out of history that helped to set this revolution in motion, Mackendale and Bookman. I am saying that Jamaica forgot its revolutionary heritage. And once a people forget their revolutionary heritage, they come like beggars with an empty cup at the door of a people less than they are, only they don't know that the people are less than they are. They follow people who don't know where they are going just because the people are the color of power. Because Marcus Garvey is descendant of the revolutionary black Jamaican Maroons who fought. He did not grow up <coughs> with all the color caste stipulation and all the color caste privileges and fear of other Jamaicans. Now you can see the mentality of Marcus Garvey emerging you can see now why he get all the nerve in the bum bath because he grew up with confidence in himself. And besides, he was a master craftsman. And being a master craftsman, mastering a trade that is needed, almost indispensable to the island, this gave him confidence and a low privilege. He was a master printer. He would print, he would call strikes, he would ask for better condition, and he would go down throughout Central America asking for better condition but studying the people. Now you can see the antecedents of Marcus Garvey before he would arrive in the United States. He would go to England, he would uh, work, he would study, he would, he would work on Dues Muhammad Ali's newspaper, the African Times, an Orient Review. He would read an editorial in that 
mag in that newspaper, the editorial was, quote, from a, of all things, a white black nationalist named Booth. Booth was a man in Niasaland, now, now the country called Malawa. He had grown sick of other white missionaries, and he went through this, this country telling the Africans the white man cannot be trusted. And he was saying, Africa for the Africans. When finally the Africans said that you're a white man, can you be trusted? To his everlasting credit, he said no. <laughs> Marcus Garvey would read in Deuce Muhammad Ali's paper the quote from Boo, said Africa for the African. And Marcus Garvey would add, those at home and those abroad. One thing about Marcus Garvey, he never stole from a second raider. <laughs> and he always rehashed what he took from others in such a way it became his. Add his own original stamp to it. Coming back to Jamaica, he was a failure again in the Jamaica of that day, as much failure he would be in the Jamaica of this day because the revolutionary at atmosphere that could protect uh, Marcus Garvey does not, only, does not exist in Jamaica, it does not exist any place in the Caribbean island for this day. Okay, now let's come to the United States and let's look at his antecedents in the United States. My main point here is that Marcus Garvey did not announce anything new, but brought it in such a way and put it in a language that masses of people could understand. You could whistle it, you could feel it, and that his timing was so good. Now, 1787 in the United States, there had emerged in New England a small black elite, Frederick Douglass, Prince Hall, who started the Masons and called it the African Lodge. Blacks had fought in the American Revolution, began to demand a little privilege is based on that. Blacks had grown tired of going into white churches and sitting on the side or up in the buzzard's roof, and they had challenged whites, and after the challenge, they found the independent black church, the African the Methodist Episcopal Church. They didn't toy with this word Negro or colored. They didn't water it down with black. Black tells you how you look, but it don't tell you who you are. And they didn't deal with this word fro. <laughs> there is no fro in Africa. When an Italian, you ask the Italian what he said, I'm Italian American. He didn't say I'm a fro. <laughs> Spell it out. Italian America. So get it out of your mouth. I mean, say it straight. African. Get the word Africa all the way in there. <laughs> and don't break Africa with the word fro. Leave out the fro. I'm saying that at this point in our history, we were not only longing for Africa, we were having thoughts about return a hundred years before Marcus Garvey was born. In the African Lodge, in the early African uh, societies, the first Masonic order found by a man from, Barbados, from Barbados, Prince Hall, 
odd fellows found by man from Antigua, Peter Ogden. Now look what you got then that you don't have now. Caribbean people and African-American people working hand and side by side. No one is calling each other any names. But they realized something then you don't realize now. That the slave ship brought no West Indians, brought no black Americans, brought no Jamaicans. <laughs> because they were all African people, they had a common interest as African people. Now, first Masonic order found by a Caribbean person, Prince Hall, another lodge found by another one, Peter Ogden. When they began the early back to Africa movement, when Martin Delaney went out to search for a place for settlement, he went out with a Jamaican, Robert Campbell, who wrote a classical account of the trip, pilgrimage to my motherland, <clears throat> included in a book called Such for a Place. Delaney was a Harvard man, and he issued a Harvard man's report. His English was superb. All the I's were jot, all the T's were crossed. But if you ever get the book, make a comparison. Read Camel's book. His language is rough hued, and sometimes his center structure is off. But the man's love for Africa, for returning to Africa, his response to Africa, is pure poetry, pure commitment. Now, we're working together now, instead of calling names, making division. Our first newspaper, Freedom's Journal, is edited by another Jamaican, a Jamaican mulatto, John B. Ruswan. After he finished the editing of Freedom's Journal, he went out to Liberia and edited the Liberian Hall, a, Harrow, the, a paper that's still in existence and he was governor of one of the provinces. He didn't say, I'm a West Indian governor, I'm a Jamaican governor. He said, I'm a governor. You have to understand that this early manifestations of Pan-Africanism before it had its name, and that all of this was preparation for the ultimate emergence of a Marcus Garvey. <clears throat> David Walker's appeal Nat Turner revolt, Gabriel Prosser revolt, Denmark Beasley's revolt, especially David Walker's appeal to the colored people of the world to take up arms against your enemy. All Marcus God was at let's, let's, let's leave this place. Coming near the end of that century, a back to Africa minister. Again, a mulatto who thought that by virtue of being close to whites, he deserved some privileges. And when he discovered that his tail can be kicked just as hard as the black is black, he began to fight like the black is black. Bishop Henry McNeil Turner. He would mount an American flag in his pulpit before his sermon, then he would point to the flag and say, this flag ain't nothing but a GD rag. And he would preach a whole sermon against what this country had done to his people before he started his regular sermon. <laughs> he started a Back to Africa movement around the same time Marcus Garvey was born. And as we came into the 20th century, we were arguing over the Booker T. Washington concept, the Du Bois concept. Africans had been revolting all over Africa. The Caribbean islands are now fighting for some form of constitutional government. 
England had created a model colony in Barbados, and this is why they still think of themselves as Little England. <laughs> All of this had happened now. Marcus Garvey would begin to emerge into consciousness around 1908. After his Central American trip, he would go to England where he would meet Dues Muhammad Ali. Now, when he returned to Jamaica and tried to find the Universal Negro Improvement Association and failed in Jamaica, he came to the United States with the hope of getting the kind of money he needed to establish a school like Tuskegee. Booker T. Washington had issued him an invitation in 1950, in 1914, but when he arrived in 1916, Booker T. Washington was dead, and he couldn't get along with the people Booker T. Washington left behind. He toured the United States speaking and impressing a whole lot of people with his nerve. Now here you have to deal with something which you fail to deal with. When you grow up in a country where you are the majority, you have a different outlook on the world though you are a slave. Marcus Garvey had a different outlook on the world when you grow up in a country where you are the minority, where you have to do what most black Americans still have to do, you rise each morning and petition a white person for the right to live to the end of the day. And you can say I'm wrong, but think it over. Who do you have to get a job from? And even if you own your business, who do you have to get your products from? If you're selling vegetables, who's your wholesaler? We still rise each morning, one way or the other, petition one white person or the other for the right to live to the end of the day. Marcus Garvey came to America at a time after the First World War. Blacks were returning, being put upon riots, East St. Louis, blacks just go to a gate and ask for jobs and were driven away. They made bonfires and burned black children. And in Chicago, the riots were widespread. And Marcus Garvey would go to Chicago and rally the, the blacks. They didn't need much rallying because they had freshly arrived from the South looking for jobs in Pagan House looking for jobs in Chicago, and they'd taken so much abuse in the South, the up north, they said they, ain't, they wasn't going to take it. Many of them began to grease wire and put it across the street. And so when the thugs came in, that car hit the wire that stopped the car, then the black thug would jump out and teach them a lesson. That stopped the riots. Marcus Garvey had told them, Look what you see. They don't want us here. Not only let's go home to Africa, let's go home in our own ships. Now the dreamer began to dream the great dream. It was after the First World War. The Secretary of War, Newton D. Baker, had told black Americans that your lot will not be changed by virtue participating in this war. And to prove that, that his point, some blacks were lynched in their uniforms. We give you nothing. Blacks were not permitted in combat in the American army. Jim Pershing didn't want them near the battlefield. The French said that I will take all you got and the blacks who distinguished themselves in battle distinguished themselves under French commanders. 
the Red Cross going to the field to pick up the wounded and the dead left the blacks to die. Du Bois had written an editorial called Close Ranks. Let's forget our differences and let this war be won. And when he went to France and saw the condition, he wanted to take it all back. Close ranks for what? Now, in this atmosphere, 1917, in the red summer of 1919, riots all over the country, burning blacks down, now can you see why it was easy for Marcus Garvey to create the atmosphere and to add to the atmosphere of return because the country had rejected us and he was telling us there is a land that is yours. He said the American promise wasn't made to you. The American dream wasn't dreamed for you. I will make you a new promise. I will give you a new dream and I will give you a new land. That's Africa. 1920 he would call the largest convention of blacks ever Old Madison Square Garden, turning back 30,000 people a day, and only 30,000 could fit into the auditorium. Marcus Garvey was doing more than just giving out speeches. This man, with his multifacet of talent, presented a platform for singers, dancers, musicians, he was creating the semblance of a state. And what we have lost in the world is the idea that we once ruled a state, all our vet. During the same time, he would petition Liberia, that sick nation that rejected him and would have been a better nation had they not rejected him. He petitioned them for settlement, 1920. They did not tell him then that they weren't going to permit him because these stooges of America, who hadn't changed to this day, lied to Marcus Garvey. And someone think that because Du Bois was, had a fake position, many plenipotentiary, the Du Bois had some power. Du Bois had no power. I think we need to be honest with ourselves. I think we charge Du Bois with a whole lot that he's guilty of. He said some unfortunate things about Marcus Garvey and later lived to take it back, took it back on several occasions. And he did something most of you haven't done. You haven't admitted when you were wrong. <laughs> now, in 1923, Marcus Garvey is in difficulty with the steamship lines. The different trials, this would go on. Marcus Garvey would commit some serious errors. He would dismiss his lawyer and be his own lawyer, and he would lose his own case. There's much more to it than that. In this uh, book, there's a chapter called trials and triumphs of Marcus Garvey. But the complete trial is available in some places you can, you can get the uh, complete trial. Marcus Garvey was not guilty as charged. This is why I'm against the idea of pardoning Marcus Garvey. To pardon him indicate that he was guilty and you're asking People do forgive the guilt. I'm for the vindication of Marcus Garvey because he wasn't guilty in the first place. I'm for asking this nation to apologize for having imprisoned him. But in 1927, he was freed from Atlanta prison. While he was away, the organization did not fall apart, but it became shattered into several factions. 
because we are people with bruised ego and we suffer terribly from ego starvation. We have an, uh, envisioned an army full of generals with no privates because everybody want to be Mr. Somebody and Mrs. Somebody. We argue among ourselves, split up, and now we've got 10 heads instead of one, and neither one of them achieving anything. We are the most organized, we are the most meanest people in America. We have more leaders and less leadership than any people in this country. No centralized leadership responsible for the whole people. What would happen after the deportation of Marcus Garvey? The movement would go on in some fashion. T. Thomas Fortune, one of the great journalists we have, would still continue to work for the old Negro world, to write for it, we could continue to be its editor. It would still attract some of the most able African-American minds of that day. Farris, one of the finest intellects to come out of the Gabi movement, was now in the process of his uh, book, the, ne the Africans Abroad, still worth reading after all these years. In the shadow of the Gabi movement, a whole literature emerged. Tony Martin, Wellesley College, who, do, who did the book Race First, have done some smaller books dealing with different aspects of Garveyism, Garvey and Pan-Africanism, literary Garveyism, Garvey as a hero. All these books need to be read. We as a people overhear conversations and sometimes with a cocktail in our hand, and we become authorities on what we heard, but we didn't read the book. <laughs> Why don't you shock me by reading a whole book? <laughs> Every page of it. Then quote correctly when you're quoting. Marcus Garvey in Jamaica would run for public office. He would win once. Second time around, the mulatto group that he had attacked so scathingly was waiting for him the second time. And he would lose on a technicality. He would find himself in debt and he would go back to his trade as a master printer. He would pay off his debt. And then he would prepare to go to England. As he boarded the ship going to England, all the reporters gathered around to hear the last words of Marcus Garvey before he departed. He says, all right, come on, come on, let me, let me, I've got something to say. Yes, yes, yes. Listen. And in the silence with that pen all to this great message, Marcus Garvey said, Jamaica is a red ridiculous country. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> A contradiction to end all contradictions. Marcus Garvey knew something that the Jamaicans still don't seem to know. They could have been one of the great island nations of the world. They got so involved with color, caste, and class, they did not become they got so involved in being those things most unlike themselves. They could not become what they needed to become and to develop that great potential. It may not be too late. Then again, it may be too late. They have the manpower. They have the educational power. They have the brain power. They have the trained personnel. They've got a good, strong uh, working class. They've got a country with a good basic climate, a lot of greenery everywhere. 
It generally rains at night, and so when you wake up in the morning, things are green. With a little manipulation, it can grow most of the thing it needs to eat, the things it needs to eat. It don't have to import Kellogg's corn flakes. They can make <laughs> corn flakes out of Jamaican corn. If you use your uh, imagination, Jamaica once made a good grade of furniture. It's now collector's items that you can ever get to buy a piece. Good Jamaican mahogany existed then. They cut it so fast until now they have to wait 20 years before it's mature enough to cut again. Jamaican mahogany used to have seven different grains, seven, I mean, seven different colors of mahogany. A light mahogany, a dark mahogany, a brownish mahogany. Can you think of making a piece of furniture with all that beautiful design on it? I went to a school in Jamaica where the schoolmaster showed me a bed, and he said, my grandfather was born on this bed. I was born on the bed. My mother was born on the bed. The bed was so strong you could put a truck on top of the bed and wouldn't even dent it. <laughs> Good old mahogany. You don't see that kind of wood anymore, and you don't see that kind of craftsmanship anymore because people don't take that amount of time anymore. Now let me conclude something that has no conclusion because Marcus Garvey is part of a continuum. He would set in motion the thought pattern that would bring African independent nations into being. He would so influence people in Africa until in Swaziland, an old king thought that his people were about to return, began to plant extra crops to feed them when they got there. The concept of Garveyism was that strong. His newspapers were given to different sailors and dropped off at different ports in other parts of the world. Cuba had 27 branches of the Garvey movement. In Cuba, with 16 branches in South Africa. I've gone through a lot of the Garvey records. I advise you that you should read Robert Hill's documents. In the, of the Garvey papers. The sixth volume is already out. I have up to five right now. The documentation is just absolutely magnificent. One of the great jobs of research done in our times by a black scholar. Now, Robert Hill's notes and Robert Hill's introductions, scholarly done, some of his conclusions open to question, but I tell you the one thing you need not doubt. The documents are documents. He couldn't change the documents. And when a definitive history of Marcus Garvey is written, and it may not be done in our times, we will have to rely very heavily on the documents that Professor Hill has brought to our attention. This is the greatest collection of documents on Marcus Garvey that has ever been uh, developed and, and edited. His influence would be so widespread that he would be the major influence in the fifth pan-African Congress, one of the most important, Manchester, England, 1945, with Nkrumah, George Padmore, Peter Abrahams, John Stone Kenyatta, who later became Jomo Kenyatta, people who would later become heads of state in Africa, influenced by the teachings of Marcus Garvey and who would incorporate the teachings of Marcus Garvey 
into the structure of that nation. And Krumah would have a Black Star Square, Black Star Line. And Krumah's in, Marcus Garvey's influence on in Krumah was profound. Marcus Garvey's influence on the rest of Africa was equally profound. And had these states not been waylaid imitating the parliamentary procedure of the West that's never going to work in Africa, they could have brought great African territorial states into being as against these imitation European nation states that now exist in Africa, too restrictive for the African character, too restrictive for African culture. The European created the nation state with its tight borders and its selfishness. The African had the territorial state where a multiplicity of cultures existed within, bo within one border with respect for all. And they did not begin a conflict one to the other until the European came and created that conflict. So-called tribal wars did not start in Africa until the coming of the European. When you would put one against the other in order to conquer both. Every person that came into Africa did Africa a disservice. Earlier today, I was accused of Arab bashing in an interview over WNYC. I was saying that the, Africa, the Arab slave trade started 1,000 years before the European slave trade, and that it drained Africa of so much time and energy and organization, the Africa did not have the organization and the energy to successfully resist the European slave trade. What Marcus Garvey was saying to us, in essence, is that I will make you a whole people again. I will heal the wounds of this 500 years of oppression. He would ask the question, where are your men of affairs? Where are your captains of industry? Having not found them, he began to try to make them. And restoring our confidence in ourselves, the confidence to rule whole nations. He would tell us, up, up, you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. Now let's apply that to today, because you have a lot of fake independent states in Africa. How can a nation in Africa be independent when it is so dependent on the European it does not even produce the safety pin to hold his child's diaper together. Don't even produce the toilet paper for his bathroom. Don't even produce his underwear. No nation of people so unproductive, so unimaginative that they don't even produce their underwear cannot call themselves free. We have to study the Liberia scheme. We must study the over $50,000 in equipment he had placed in Liberia before they told him in 1924 they wasn't going to let him settle. Steam shovels, people who could, who could run brickyards, builders, architects, all the means of a nation. And had he been permitted to settle in Liberia, and cure the wounds of that sick nation, the African independence explosion would have occurred a generation before and would have been successful. This dreamer from Jamaica, who is still not understood in Jamaica or in the African world in total, 
need to be looked at again in context with our future. We might have to step back in order to move forward. We might have to resign ourselves to eating the food we produce, wearing the clothes that we make. We might understand that a nation means self-reliance. We might take an inventory and find out what goes into the making of a nation. And we might start at the top and fulfill all those needs. If you're going to make a locomotive, sometime you might start by making a safety pin. And remember, other people in the world started with less. 200 years ago, the Japanese did not even have a good wheelbarrow. Look at them now. Someone challenged them. Someone challenged them to come out of the lethargy of that culture and meet the challenge of a changing world. The intelligence of a people can be measured by to what extent they adjust and understand the nature of change. We, as a people, are going to have to prove ourselves equal to the nature of change. And to prove yourself equal to the nature of change, you have to prove yourself equal to the nature of revolution. And realize revolution is, all, is not always killing people. Revolution is making a dramatic change in your own life and the life around you. Doing for yourself what you've been expecting other people to do for you. You cannot start by hoping to have a great mass around you. You can take the teachings of Marcus Garvey, especially his African fundamentals, You can look at the documents compiled by um, Professor Hill. You can look at the work compiled by Professor Martin, Tony Martin, and other scholars who found different approaches to Marcus Garvey. You can make up your mind that you're going to have to stop being those small selfishness, selfish people worrying about petty sororities and fraternities and a whole lot of things, wasting your time. You're going to have to learn that everything that touches your life must contribute to your liberation or be thrown into the ash can of history. If you're going to start a revolution, I advise that you start with a mirror. You stand before that mirror and like what you see and say to the person staring at you, you and I are going to change the world. We're not going to wait for a mob to join us. We're not going to wait for tomorrow because we're going to start right now. Thank you. Now we're going to have questions and answers. 
Um, I'll point out the uh, people who asked the question, so please raise your hands. In the back. Well, let's not use, let's use some kind of word. Let's say that they, they uh, fail to bring it off because the pyramids were built by people with a specific mind and a specific attitude at a given time in history. And the pyramids went beyond mechanics. The building of the pyramids was a great spiritual event in history. And to have the mechanics without the spirit in the time didn't mean very much. And besides, do we need another pyramid to be built? <laughs> if we did it once, must, must there be duplications of this impossibility? friend, Mr. Stedman, and I appreciate you being here, and I appreciate the support that you have given me personally over the years, and the recognition that you have given to myself and Dr. Ben and other scholars who try to get out a message. The ANC and Nelson Mandela is a delicate thing because I am a great admirer of the man, and I think he's the finest African to emerge since Kwame Nkrumah. Now, when I say this, and say that I have some honest differences of opinion, you have to understand this honest difference of opinion is based on the fact that I have been related to African revolutionary ideas most of my life, and I think that some publicity, some admission should have been made about the work of the PAC, Pan-Africanist Congress. Some work should have, some words should have been said about the movement of Stephen Biko, African consciousness, the unity movement led by Mr. Tapata, some words should have been said about the role of women in the South African struggle, and there are two new good books on the subject, and that ANC becomes as acceptable to white people as the NACP. And inasmuch as integration has already failed, we need to say that to acknowledge the fact that Nelson Mandela, a great strategist, might have been saying some things for strategy that he might have to change later on, some things that are unreal 
when he said a multiracial society. I don't know of any multiracial society in history that one people had to be in charge. I don't know of a non-racist society in all human history. And I don't know of any society in history where the Europeans shared power with the non-Europeans. <laughs> If I catch a thief in my home and I've got a six room, I'm not going to negotiate with the thief and say, you stay in the back room or the front room so long as you behave yourself. I'm going to negotiate with the undertaker to take the thief away. <laughs> now, I don't think Nelson Mandela can afford to say things like this, but Maybe I can say them because I've got nothing to lose but my obscurity. <laughs> but we need to be honest with ourselves because nations are coming into being in, Af in Africa that are fake. Namibia is not free. Whites bought up all the real estate, took all the money out of the country, then tell the Af give the African a limousine and say, now you're free. You got limousine and a pride. They're deep in debt. People don't send armies anymore, they send money. They take all of your money and they send part of it back as a loan. Then they send one of them to manage the money and manage you in debt to the fact, to the point that you got to obey them when they tell you what to do. Money is the new form of imperialism. We need to look at Southern Africa. We need to look at the so, whole lot, front line states. We need to look at the fact that they are, no African came to power in Angola. And one of the reasons why a faker, a sellout, a stooge of the M of the FBI like uh, Zavimbe could get so much play is that he's, he's disguised as a nationalist. He looks like the people, he walks among the people, and they see him, they touch him. But those assimilators who took over power are mostly half Portuguese, where Portuguese clothes belong to the Catholic Church, and most of them got Portuguese wives. They don't relate to the people. So the people never came to power in, in Angola. That's a beautiful country, and a big country, and a rich country. We got to stop glorifying these fakers who come to power and sell us a bill of goods. Whites bought up all the real estate and got a hold of all the land in Namibia. Now you're free. Free how? The people of Namibia, you should go back and understand the spirit of old King Mendume in the Herero War, 1904. When he challenged the Germans, the Germans drove 60,000 women out into the desert to cohabit or die because they wanted to create a bastard race. They did not know the Herrera woman never cohabits outside of her tribe, not even with another African. And she sworn by custom to bring virginity to her wedding bed. Now you think all Africans are promiscuous? You better think again. Now if you want to find an African who experiment before the marriage, you go to the go go up look further among the men they speaking people. Then then if with the pool of mother and father, you can stay together and have two or three children for the wedding. You have many customs and many cultures in Africa. They all don't work a lot. And old King Mendume pulled his people together and said that we are proud people. We walked the earth carrying the sun on our shoulders. If we let this happen to our women, we would have to put down the sun and the world will be in darkness. Look at the symbols now. He took, he unified the members and the Hereros and took them into that battle. He lost one third of the whole Herero nation, but he rescued those women and brought them home. And the Germans never touched them again. 
or tried to, become World War I and when the German was given three years to pack and get out of Namibia, they said, we'll only need one. <laughs> they was out of that. But they rehearsed for Nazism in Namibia. And yet you got Germans right there now managing, helping to manage the country. We are so liberal and our memory bank is so short, bankrupt. People who raped our mother walking around free as a bird among us, grinning in our face. We don't even have enough meanness to get justifiable revenge. <laughs> There's certain revenge that's owed to every man who's got manhood. I grew up in a community where you didn't even say bad words in front of a man's sister. I mean, I put up my dukes even if I'm afraid. Man, you don't talk that way from my sister. <laughs> we can say anything in front of your sister, mother, grandma. You hear those, don't bat an eye now. There's no relationship between what you're talking about and what I said, and I hate to break your heart, but uh, I, uh, I accept the Bible as basically Jewish folklore, and the Bible was written by the so-called chosen people. And any time we want to become a chosen people, all we have to say is that we are hereby chosen. <laughs> Well, I doubt if most of the people, I think a lot of them, uh, because they're anti, they begin to get dissatisfied with the religion of their oppressor, they turn to an alternative religion. But uh, Islam is not only an oppressive religion, like all organized religions. All organized religions are religions of oppression. All organized religions are murder cults. All organized religions are male chauvinist religions. <laughs> I can identify with the good values of any religion, and I can reject the bad interpretations of any religions. I just happen to know that most blacks who think they're Muslims are really Arabs. You accepted the Arabs' interpretation of Islam, the same as we accept the Europeans' interpretation of Christianity. You go from one, one, one fire into another fire. You jump in frying pans, and they're both hot. Now, I'm not saying don't be religious. I'm a spiritual human being myself, so therefore I don't feel any need for any form of organized religion. And uh, I grew up a Baptist. I was a Baptist Sunday school teacher. And I go to Baptist churches once in a while. In fact, I'll be in one this, sum this Sunday. I go to my sister's home, and she's a Jesus freak. And <laughs> I'm not going to insult her. She cooks too well anyway. I mean, I don't offend members of my family, you know, who think the Lord sent everything. So my sister wants me to come down for a few days and spend with her, and, and she's uh, even did something which I don't give a damn about. She's even bought a burial plot so that <laughs> when the good Lord sees fit to call us home, <laughs> you and I who struggle together will be laying side by side, <laughs> our souls in the arms of God. So, all right. <laughs> Well, who's going to argue with that? 
I got relatives who's a preacher. I don't preachers. I don't insult them. I go into Old Macedonia Baptist Church where I was a child. I used to teach Sunday school, and I'm not going to curse and disrespect to all those old ladies. And I'm not saying there is no God in the Bible, Jewish folklore. Not, not, not there in Macedonia. <laughs> those people knew me when I needed my diaper change. You see, they just as proud they be. He's gone up north and made something out of himself. Now he's coming back home and, you know, and dwelling among them. They're, they're about 90 now, and, and I'm approaching enough. <laughs> I mean, look, don't think that I'm offensive to every form of religion, but I can identify every form of organized religion as a form of oppression. And I personally do not need any of it. And I'm a very spiritual person. I'm a very giving person. I'm a very caring person. I love my children. And I would have loved my wife had she been lovable. <laughs> do we have another question? Yes. Such for children. I have some questions about the curricula of inclusion. I respect the people who participated in making it. I respect the idea. But if I'm going to be included in something that is faulty, what's the point? Now you got two faults instead of one. I advise you to read and understand the nature of curricula and organize parents, and once you get the truth outlined, go and challenge the school system. Now, go in there and tell them, now tell me in all honesty, did Christopher Columbus really discover America? <laughs> <laughs> then outline all the different people that got murdered because of, you know, and ask some serious questions as to whether he should be a, a hero. Then ask some questions about the economic basis of America based on slavery. Could this nation be the same without slavery? And don't they owe us something over and above anything they're willing to consider? I think people are going to have to read a lot. Some people will have to just sit down and devote a little more time to reading so that they can furnish other people the means of having a successful argument with the uh, school system. And there's another point, it may not mean anything to you, but once you get this point across, I think somebody's gonna listen to you still. The education system, the way it is now structured, is also cheating white students. White students need a different kind of information in the world of tomorrow, a different kind of information than they've got right now because they're not going to always be dealing with black people who mopping floors. They're going to be dealing with black people who can make a million dollar contract and they can win it or lose it based on their understanding and their respect for him. And when they understand that that economic system might be based on the human relationship or basic respect, they're going to realize they're going to learn some history in the hub. And there's going to be some correct history. They're going to stop saying, you never invented anything, you never, 
So they're going to look up black, they're going to be quoting more black inventors than you. <laughs> Is that from Malcolm what? The African Americans who are sitting on the boards of education who are contributing to the security to destroy our country. I'm, I'm thinking the community should just try to get rid of them. I, you got so many, you got a lot of anti black blacks, so you got to face it. You, you got a lot of blacks long overdue in their grave. <laughs> I wouldn't advise you to do it, but... <laughs> there must be some brothers who got much to lose. <laughs> Excuse me, you, 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 she, she's obviously right because acting like a Baptist preacher, I went all over the place. I'm sorry, miss, whoever. Uh, with that said, we have three more questions. One over here. I'm afraid I didn't put. I missed something. I wanted to know if it was true or not whether uh, WD Ford was the key lieutenant of Garvey and the Russian were supposed to be part of it. I won't find it in no books because uh, it's of no uh, great interest of mine whether it's true or not, but I don't know any books that that points to it. I think I think Mr. Ford was a mystery and will remain a mystery. He could be a piece of fiction. Whether he was real or not, I don't know, but somebody got a picture of him, so he must have lived sometime. We have a second question over here on the left. A. Sylvester Williams. Yes, yes, he was a Trinidadian. Right. Uh, could you um, put some light on um, contribution towards the Pan-African movement? And um, second question is uh, Let's answer H. Sylvester Williams first. H. Sylvester Williams was a Trinidadian lawyer. He found the Pan-African League. And out of the concept of a Pan-African League, he developed the concept of a Pan-African Congress. And he called this uh, first meeting in London, 1900. And uh, only the Africans who happened to be living in London attended, and Du Bois attended. And they did not demand independence for Africa. They demanded Africans be given the kind of education that they needed so that they would eventually prepare themselves to rule a state. Very moderate demand, moderate demands. And the next Pan-African Congress would increase the demands. And even when it came to 1919, the one that Du Bois uh, called, they were still asking for the ability to give the Africans the kind of education that will equip them for independence. It was at the Congress, at the Pan-African Congress of 1945 in Manchester, England, that they stopped asking that Africans be given the privilege of being equipped. They said that Africa's already equipped. Africa wants freedom now. It wants the right, it has just as much right to experiment with it as any other people. And this is the uh, Pan-African Congress that really set in motion the African independence explosion. And, but H. Sylvester Williams would set in motion the concept of the unification of all Africa, you know, based on the political framework of, of Africa. There's, there's some good books on that, but three books on him. Um, George Padmore and his Pan-Africanism or Communism and some good chapters on him. And there's uh, some books uh, on just H. Sylvester Williams alone. I have a Pan-African shelf in 
my library that's uh, being turned over to Atlanta University, but I kept the Pan-African part because I have to finish a book on the subject. But uh, there's no shortage of works on H. Sylvester Williams. There have been several good masters and PhD theses written on him also. No, go ahead. What's the next one? Well, that's by George Padmore. I think we should stop thinking that everything in our life must be determined by socialism or communism. I think we must be free by any means necessary. <laughs> and we should use the methods that makes us free, no matter what label they call them. We don't necessarily have to give it a label anyway, so long as it makes us free. I mean, the, everything that came from the Europeans' mind was meant to facilitate European control over the world. The four things that the Europeans have announced most to the world are all failed. Democracy, Christianity, both communism and capitalism, they're all failures. Because they were not rooted in the people and interest in the people. They were rooted in the exploitation of the people. They wanted the people to follow, but they didn't want the people to ask any questions. And they did not want to be accountable to the people. The government of tomorrow, if it's to exist any place in the world, but especially in Africa, must be accountable to the people. Must be, the ruler must come back and give an account of what he did to the people. Otherwise, this government of dictatorship, almost like an absentee land law. But you had these kind of sharing governments in Africa before. You had them before Europeans wore shoes or lived in a house that had a window. The Africans didn't call it socialism or communism. The Africans just lived it out. And there was no starvation and no war. We quite forget that over half of human history was over before anyone know, knew that a European was in the world. We have a third and final question over on your left. Question. Yes. Uh, it's Dr. Clark. Uh, one of the major problems in front of us is the uh, pitting of African people against each other, uh, commonly called tribalism. I was wondering if you could identify some unifying uh, force or forces that can help us overcome that problem and in any way uh, we can support that effort here. Well, the one thing that should unify us in that regard is that we all have the same enemy, the same oppressor, with the same intentions, wherever we are on the face of this earth. And we should identify ourselves as an African people and unify and assist all African people on the face of the earth, wherever we live on the face of the earth. 